forgiven. That is a word that finds its way into our dialogue with each other all the time, doesn't it? It pops up in the songs that we sing together. It, it makes its way into our prayers when we are talking before the Lord's Supper. Inevitably, forgiveness finds its way into those comments. It's something that when we're together, it just seems to come up all the time, this business of, of being forgiven. In fact, I think that, that it may come up so frequently that there's a danger that it can become common to us. And that we can run past forgiveness in our conversations and talk about it without really remembering what it is to be forgiven and what that means for me and you. It is a concept, brothers and sisters, that goes to the very core of the Bible, doesn't it? The Bible story. If you think about that, go back to Genesis chapter 3 and remember that the problem at the beginning is sin. That's the problem being confronted in Scripture. And what man needs because he sins is, is forgiveness, right? And so really when you think about it, the whole Bible story is about God providing forgiveness. In Genesis 12 in verse 3, that blessing that would come through Abraham's descendant, through, through Jesus, is, is the blessing of forgiveness, the salvation from our sins that would be accomplished through Jesus' work on Calvary. Really, the, the whole of the Bible story is about being forgiven. And yet, there is so much more that needs to be said and that can be said than just those broad concepts. For example, will you appreciate with me that when Jesus forgives us, He forgives us completely. I love the language that Luke uses in the book of Acts in chapter 3 when he describes how our sins are wiped away. Literally, the language there is that they are obliterated. They are, they are gone. In fact, if you'll be heading in your Bibles to Romans 12, 5, rather, Romans chapter 5, I can tell you how literally sins are gone when we're washed clean by Jesus. In Romans 12, I'm sorry, why do I keep saying 12? Romans 5, down at verse 10, that's what I want. Paul says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Think about that. Sin is so completely removed from us that this barrier that stood between us and God, it's gone now. And while our sins made us the enemy of God, now we can be His friend again. Why? Because sin is gone. But there's more than that. Not only is sin completely taken away by the blood of Jesus, but brothers and sisters, that applies to any sin. Jesus will forgive us of anything that we have done. It doesn't matter what the sin is. We struggle with that, don't we? I've talked to some folks who really wrestle to believe that, that God would forgive them. I've talked to some men who cheated on their wives and made unbelievable messes and just hurt people in deep and profound ways. And I've talked to some, some fellows who've done some awfully terrible things to support a drug habit. And you know I've spent some time talking to some men who killed people. And I'm going to tell you, they really wrestled with this idea that God would forgive us of anything that we have done. And maybe some of you are thinking, yeah... Boy, if you knew the life that I had lived and where I've been, the kind of things I'd done, yeah, maybe for you people who are who, who've lived pretty reasonably good lives, maybe you can think of a being forgiven by your comparatively smaller mistakes. That's our thinking, but but man, I've been so bad. I just don't know. Will God really forgive me? And the answer to that question is He absolutely will. There is no sin that God will not forgive 
when we seek it. Think about this passage in 1 John. This is 1 John chapter 1. Look down at verse 9. 1 John 1 verse 9. John writes, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from almost any unrighteousness. Is that what your Bible says? Sometimes I misread on purpose because I want you to see that's not what He said, right? He said He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Question, what does that not cover? What sin doesn't fall under all unrighteousness? Do you see the point? And now let's be clear about something. To say that God will forgive us of anything, that is not saying that sin isn't a big deal. God will forgive us of anything because really your sins don't matter all that much. That's not what we're saying at all. Sin is a terrible thing with horrific consequences. The fact that God will forgive us is not a testimony to sin's littleness. It is a testimony to the greatness of God's love. Go back to Romans 5. Again, let's notice what Paul said about that. In Romans chapter 5, now that I've got the chapter right, Romans 5, look down at verse verse 7, where Paul says, For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But listen to verse 8. Listen to the beginning. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrates His own love for us. The fact that He will forgive us of anything is a testimony to the depth of His love. It is a testimony to the power of Christ's sacrifice, to the power of His blood to cleanse us. That's what it's about, folks. And listen, not only will He forgive us of anything, but I want you to know that that applies to anyone. There isn't anyone that God isn't willing to forgive. Forgiveness is for every person. And so, when He sent us out on the Great Commission in Mark 16 and verse 15, He said, go preach the gospel to all the people that are pretty good, right? He said, go preach the gospel to every creature. Matthew 28 and verse 19, go make disciples of all the nations. Why does God want us to preach to everyone? Because Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 2 that God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Salvation isn't reserved for just a few special people. It is for everyone. God wants everyone to be saved. And let me add that He is willing to forgive us continually. What happens when we mess up again and again And again, have you been there? Have you ever had that moment in your life where you found yourself on your knees praying about something that you had done, you feel terrible about, and as you're praying it, you you, you remember, I was talking to God about this last week. Same exact thing. I have failed in exactly the same way. Or maybe it wasn't last week. Maybe it was yesterday. Or earlier in the day. I did exactly the same thing. And you begin to think to yourself, surely God is sick of this. I was doing this this morning, and I came to God, and I confessed it. I said I was wrong, and now it's in the afternoon, and I'm praying exactly the same prayer again. Surely by now, God in heaven is saying, enough, dude, I'm done with you. Can't get this right? But brothers and sisters, that is not true. When a man is penitent and sorry, when he comes to God, God will forgive us again and again and again. In fact, can I just add this to our list while we're working on this list? We need to know that God is eager to forgive us. He doesn't extend forgiveness reluctantly. Well, I said I'd do it. I guess I have to. Micah says of him in Micah 7 and verse 18, Who is a God like you who pardons sin 
and forgives the transgression of the remnant of inheritance. You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. Do you hear that? God delights to show mercy. Can I take y'all back just for a moment to last night, Luke 15, and what we're saying about the Father there? Do you remember that we said the Father is a symbol for God? Will you get in your minds just one more time the image of that wayward prodigal coming back to his Father? Do you remember how the Father received him? Not with an I told you so. Not with, well, I guess I have to. How he embraces him and loves him and takes him back and celebrates him. Brothers and sisters, that is the God that we serve. A God who is eager to forgive us, who wants to see us come home, who wants us to repent. I think about his relationship with Israel in the Old Testament. I mean, those, those people, his people, were just so unbelievably rebellious again and again and again. And you get into that period of the divided kingdom when the northern kingdom has just gone off the reservation. They're just involved in all kinds of idolatry and evil and wickedness. They're morally corrupt. And the southern nation, they had some good periods, but they weren't far behind doing terrible things, even to the point of, of, of sacrificing their infant children to the pagan gods. You would think that somewhere out there, God would just say, enough of you people, I don't want anything else to do with you. And yet, why do we have the prophets? Listen, folks, the prophets weren't just sent so God could tell you, I'm about to drop the hammer on you people and bring judgments. They did say that. But they said it because God hoped that through the message of the prophet, the hearts of his people would be changed and they would come back to him. That's what God wanted. What God wanted is for them to repent, and he wanted to, to forgive them. And he wants to forgive me and you too. It doesn't matter where you are or what you've done. He wants you to come home. He is eager for you to come back home. He wants to forgive you. In fact, I can tell you how bad he wants that. If you'll go to 1 Peter chapter 1, God wants that so much that he made a dramatic, dramatic offer to make it possible. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 18, Peter would tell us that we're not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from the feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers. That's not what bought us back out of sin. What did? Precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless the blood of Christ. God so much wants to forgive us that His Son served as the sacrifice to make that possible. He is eager to forgive. He wants us to come home. And so, may we be careful that we never allow forgiveness to become common to us just words in a song or words before the Lord's Supper it is a big deal to be able to say I have been forgiven now if I'm sitting in your shoes tonight I'm wondering about the meeting flyer that said on Wednesday night David's going to be talking about bitterness and maybe you're thinking I think he forgot he was supposed to talk about bitterness tonight I didn't, because we're getting there. And here's the bridge. There is, brothers and sisters, a corresponding responsibility that falls on those of us who have been forgiven, because that's what happened to us. Scripture says that I need then to be forgiven. In fact, there's a great parable about that in Matthew 18, and I want us to read it together tonight. So we go to Matthew 18. Let me set a little context for you. In Matthew 18 and verse 15, Jesus has been talking about what happens 
when a brother sins against you. Are y'all familiar with that context, Matthew 18, 15, where he says, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. Remember that whole conversation there that's been going on? He's talking about what happens when your brother sins against you. Now that's warming up, right? Because after he says that, in verse 21, Peter has a question. Peter's still thinking back on the Lord's instruction. If someone sins against you, go to them. If, if they repent, you've won your brother. And Peter wants to know this, verse 21. Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And so Peter's thinking, well, what if this happens over and over again? I mean, do I just have to keep forgiving this guy who does things to hurt me? And so the Lord, the Lord answers with a parable. Will you look at 23? Let's read this together all the way to the end of the chapter. Jesus says, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle his accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. That's an impossible debt, folks, one that could never be paid. Verse 25, but since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and his children and all that he had and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. I wish the story ended there. Because that's a great story. But it doesn't. Verse 28 says, That slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, a little debt. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling. And went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. And summoning him, his Lord said, you wicked slave. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Now listen to 33. Should you not have also had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way I had mercy on you? And his Lord was moved with anger and handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed. Do you see it? Who is the king in the parable? It's God. Who is that first slave with the un, unforgivable debt, the one that could never be repaid? That's me and you. And what did the king do for us? He forgave the debt completely he wiped our slate clean and so what i want you to see in verse 33 is that there is of necessity a corresponding obligation to people who have been recipients of that kind of mercy verse 33 the master says you should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave do you see it if you have been forgiven You should forgive. And as you read this story and you feel your blood boil at the injustice of what this man did, remember that's what we do. When 
and we choose to harbor bitterness and refuse to forgive. In fact, what's interesting to me is that Jesus does not want us to miss that point. You notice I didn't read verse 35 because verse 35, what he does is he he cuts right to the heart of this for me and you. He says, my heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Lord doesn't want us to miss it here. He says, I'm talking to you. And your responsibility to forgive. As you have been forgiven, so you are to forgive. And so, brothers and sisters, Jesus becomes the model for us. In fact, the text is overt about that. If you'll jump ahead to Ephesians 4. Will you look there, please? Ephesians 4, down in verse 31 where Paul will write, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted. Here it is, forgiving each other. But what's the last part say? Do you see it? Forgiving each other just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. And so Jesus becomes the model for us. We are to forgive like the Master forgave. So, can we go back to our list? How does Jesus forgive? Well, He he forgives completely, doesn't He? And so when you and I forgive, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to forgive completely, aren't we? Do we do that? I worry sometimes, brothers and sisters, that when there's been a problem even when we sit out and work it out and maybe apologies are made and hugs are exchanged and outwardly everything seems all right, inwardly sometimes it isn't, is it? And buried deep within our heart, maybe feelings we don't even acknowledge to ourselves, they're still lurking there, those bitter roots of bitterness toward the person who offended us. Have you been there? Boy, you painted on the smile when you were around them. But inside, when you were in their company, your gut kind of tightened up and you could feel your temperature get a little hot and you would revisit that offense and the bitterness was just lurking down in there. You know, that's kind of like trying to hold a basketball into the water. We had a pool in our backyard when I was growing up and I actually tried that futile exercise. You ever done that? Try to hold a basketball into the water? How does that work out? Ah, for a minute, right? But eventually, the pressure of that water is going to push that ball right out of the pool. And that's what happens to us when we harbor bitterness in our heart. We can push it down in there for a while, but I promise you, you can't hold it forever. And over time, the pressure is going to build, and it's going to start coming out in our words and in our actions toward that other person. That's why Paul says, if you look back in Ephesians 4, remember Verse 31, what does he tell us to do with all that garbage that goes, around, goes along with our grudge? He says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander, what are you supposed to do with it? He says, put it away from you. We've got to forgive. We've got to get rid of all that junk so there's nothing there left to feed the grudge. All that there's left to do is just to be kind to one another and tender-hearted. And let me just acknowledge tonight, let me be honest with you, I know the easiest thing in the world to do is stand up here and talk about this. It's not hard to read with you what the Bible says. Doing it when your feelings are hurt and someone's offended you. Let me be candid with you. It is extraordinarily difficult. And maybe it's difficult because we don't think enough about Matthew 18. And what the Lord has done for us. And what a terrible insult it is to His grace and mercy. With all that He's forgiven us. To refuse to forgive others. Maybe it would get easier if we would think about that a little more often. Remember also that we're supposed to be willing to forgive anything. Right? No matter what the offense is. So, let's grab a couple of more passages. Now I'm headed to Colossians. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3, verse 12. So, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, and here it is again, and forgiving each other, 
whoever has a complaint against anyone, and then Paul says it again, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. So it doesn't matter what the offense is. It doesn't matter what someone has done to us. No matter what it is, I'm supposed to be willing to forgive. Now let me tell you why that's important. It answers our justification that sometimes I have a right to be bitter because this thing that was done to me was so extraordinarily awful, I have a right to keep on being mad about it. We do that, don't we? Maybe under ordinary circumstances, when it's some little thing, yeah, I've got to do what the Lord does and I've got to, or says and I've got to forgive. But you don't understand, David, in this case, this was a big deal. What this person did to me was exceptionally terrible. And so that justifies me continuing to be angry about it. That's why when you try to talk to people about their bitter grudges, instead of saying, yeah, I need to be more like the Lord, what they want to do is say, let me tell you how awful that person was. Let me tell you how terrible what they did to me was. Let me tell you how it made me feel. Well, what we need to do is go back to what the Lord said. How about in Mark 11? Look at this passage, Mark 11. And I've headed down to verse 25. Listen to Jesus, Mark 11, 25. When you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgression. Man, that's a tough verse. What doesn't get covered by anyone, anything rather, against anyone? What's left out there? And you and I think we've been tested about that. Let me tell you about a lady I know who was tested about that. Her name was Thomasine Crow. She was the mother of Carl Wrinkle. Does that name ring a bell? I told you about Carl Sunday night. The young 22-year-old grocery store owner murdered by Ricky Blackman. Thomasine was Carl's mother. About a week before Ricky was executed, Thomasine arranged to meet with Ricky. Will you just kind of process that for a minute? This murderer had a nine-hour meeting with the mother of the young man he killed. Ricky never told me much about that meeting. Although he did say these two things. That Thomasine said that she forgave him and that she hoped he went to heaven. The next day after Ricky was executed, the paper interviewed her and she said something that I wrote down because I never wanted to forget it. She said, I can hate Ricky Blackman and be miserable and bitter for the rest of my life. Or I can accept his apology and learn to be happy with that and go on. And that is what I choose to do. Thomasine taught me two lessons. First of all, she taught me not to overestimate the size of my wounds. She makes me embarrassed of the petty, bitter grudges that I have held. And she reminds me that bitterness is a choice. You don't have to keep being mad about it. You don't have to hang on to the offense. It isn't so terrible that you can't get past it. Keeping it, nursing it, brothers and sisters, is a decision. 
and forgiving is a decision. Anything and anyone. That's what the Lord said in Mark 11, wasn't it? Anything against anyone. There's not one standard of forgiveness for the people I'm close to and love and I really want to fix and have a good relationship and for those other people who just get on my nerves and I don't really care if we're together or not. Anything against anyone. And then how about this? If we're going to be like the Lord, we need to be willing to forgive continually. That means with some people we forgive again and again and again. And you know, we've got those people who just hurt us over and over and over again. And sometimes, sometimes we're just ready to give up on them. That's really behind Peter's question, isn't it? Back in verse 21, how many times do I have to do this, Lord? If they keep sinning against me, surely there's a stopping point. Up to seven times. And what did the Lord say in verse 22? Seventy times seven. And so Jesus set the limit for us. 490 offenses. So, and I used the calculator to get that. So 491, no more forgiveness, right? That doesn't work. You know why it doesn't work? Because in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, the Holy Spirit says that we're not supposed to keep an account of, the, of wrong suffered. I don't get to keep a logbook. No, that's not what the Lord is saying. The Lord is saying, you forgive like I do. When someone comes to you and they are penitent, you forgive again and again and again. And that's hard. I've talked to some married folks. I've talked to some wives who've said, for 20 years, my husband has hurt me over and over and over again. And David, I'm tired. I just don't have it in me to forgive him anymore. Listen to me. That is a terrible predicament to be in. It grieves me when husbands and wives do each other, do things to each other that hurt each other year after year after year and damage that relationship. But, but, I'm supposed to forgive again and again and again because that's what Jesus does for me. And I'm supposed to forgive like he forgives. In fact, brothers and sisters, we are supposed to be, oh, this last one is tough. Can we just leave that one off and move on? Eager. Ready. You know, there are some people who, frankly, this is one of you, I apologize before you spar, I say it, but, but there are some folks who are a little twisted. They like having something on someone, something they hold on to and hold over their head. That is not what Christ is to us. Look at the parable of the prodigal son and how the father received his son. We don't hold things over people's heads. We don't look for opportunities to be angry and hang on to it. When something's wrong, when there's been an offense, we need to be eager, like Jesus is eager. Work it out and get it fixed. As those who've been forgiven, we have a corresponding obligation to forgive. Bitterness is a terrible storm. Someone called it a bitter poison that will consume us. So are you holding a bitter grudge tonight? Is there someone that when you get in their presence, everything is tense because way back when there was this thing and it never got worked out? Someone you avoid? What did Jesus say to do about that? First of all, he said, go. Where this silly idea came from, that somehow, if I feel like I'm the one offended, I'm supposed to wait for the other guy. Check out Matthew 5, 23 and 24 about that. Check out Matthew 18, 15 again. Both parties are told the same thing. Something's wrong in this relationship, whether you were offended or you did the offending. Both have the same duty. Go, there's step one. And there's step two. 
Jesus said, you forgive just like I did. I love being a preacher. Even though sometimes the work has its challenges, I love being a preacher, brothers and sisters, because I get to tell people good news. Fundamentally, that's what the gospel is. It is good news that God through Jesus Christ has provided forgiveness. And so if you're here tonight, and you know that things are not right with you and God. I don't care what the reason is. Maybe you've been a faithful disciple and you got off the path and you've been off in some sin and you need to come back. Or maybe you've never made a choice that God is going to be the word, the one you serve and you're still bearing that awful burden of sin. Wherever you are and for whatever reason, what God wants to do is he wants to forgive you. That's what the whole Bible story is about. Don't sit there and say to yourself, Yes, but I've done these awful things. Or I've been gone for so long. Surely God isn't interested in me. God doesn't want, you're not right about that. God wants everybody. He is eager for everyone to change their mind about sin and to come back to him. And if that's where you are tonight, he is waiting and ready to forgive you. If you need that, you make your way down to the front right now. While we stand, while we sing.